Located 100 kilometers north of Izmir, the laid-back market town of Bergama is the modern successor to the once powerful ancient city of Pergamum. Bergama is home to two of Turkey's most celebrated archaeological sites, Pergamum Acropolis and Asclepian, one of the earliest medical centers on record. In fact, after entering the Acropolis at Pergamum for the first time, my reaction was, why in the world isn't this place as famous as Athens or Rome? For the ruins at Pergamum are as stunning as any in the world. Built on a conical hill rising 300 meters above the surrounding valley, Pergamum, from the Greek citadel, was the most famous city in Asia. Second only to the extensive archaeological investigation at Ephesus, Pergamum offers at least a whole day of intriguing discovery for those interested in history, archaeology, and interpretation. Come with me on a journey, the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ in Turkey. The road north from Izmir follows the coastline some 65 kilometers and then turns inland in a northeasterly direction up the valley of Caicos River. About 26 kilometers inland from the Aegean Sea is located the city of Bergama. Bergama has a population of around 60,000, making it the fourth biggest city in Izmir. Bergama is a center for farming, light industry, schools, gold mining, and of course, tourism. Bergama is also renowned for its high quality carpets. There are approximately 80 villages that still weave Bergama carpets. The history of carpet weaving in Bergama dates back to the 11th century when Turkish migration started to the area. Bergama carpets have almost always been woven with wool. An attestation to the pastoral lifestyle of the Yuruk clans populating the area at the time. Most of the downtown is very navigable on foot in fact, walking is one of the pleasures of a visit to Bergamo. You can walk to all of the popular tourist destinations from the center within 15 minutes, including the Asclepion, the Acropolis Cable Car, the Archaeological Museum, and the Red Basilica. Boasting a small but impressive collection of artifacts, Bergamo's museum is well worth a visit. On exhibit are reliefs from the Acropolis, including a wonderful Roman-era relief from the Demeter Terrace, and a Hellenistic frieze from the Athena Terrace. Also impressive are the many statues from the Asclepion, the famed ancient medical center, and a mosaic floor featuring a Medusa's head that was originally in the Lower Agora. The ethnography gallery focuses on the crafts, costumes, and customs of the Ottoman period. There is a scale replica of the altar of Zeus. The original is in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, and the many objects ceramic, lace terracotta, iron, marble and glass, savaged from the excavations in both the Acropolis and the Asclepian. The Red Basilica was erected in the second century, probably under the reign of Hadrian, as a temple to the popular Egyptian god Serapis. It was later converted into a Byzantine church. It consists of main building and two round towers within an enormous terminus or sacred area. Nowadays, there is a mosque located in one of the buildings. Bergama shares the site of ancient Pergamum, where extensive ruins remain. Pergamum is reportedly named after the founder of Pergamus. Pergamum was never important until it became the capital of the independent kingdom of the Adelids after Alexander the Great. Under Eumenes II from 197 to 159 BC, Pergamum became the finest flower of Hellenic civilization. It boasted a library of more than 200,000 volumes. Legend has it that parchment was invented here when the supply of papyrus from Egypt was cut off in reprisal for Eumenes' attempt to lure a famous librarian by the name of Aristophanes away from Alexandria. 
Its last king willed it to Rome in 133 BC, when apparently it became the capital of the Roman province of Asia. In addition to its political importance, Pergamum was also a great and important religious center with temples dedicated to Zeus, Athena, the patron goddess, Dionysius, and Asclepius, the god of healing. Pergamum was also the leading center for the worship of Roman emperors. In 29 BC, as the first city of the province, Pergamum built a temple dedicated to the divine Augustus and the goddess Roma. Shortly after John's time, an amazing temple to Trajan was constructed thus ensuring the ongoing worship of the emperor. Certainly the most prominent feature in Pergamum was the gleaming temple structure and altar dedicated to Zeus Soter, that is, Zeus the Savior. This temple and the altar of Zeus were unquestionably the most spectacular features to greet the eye of the visitor arriving in the city from any of three directions. To some, the great altar appeared to be something of a throne. The additional feature giving fame to the city was the hospital and the temple of Scalipius, who was also called Scalipius Soter. The cult of Scalipius Soter not only dealt with physical healing, but also developed a doctrine of personal salvation, which was almost certainly known by the residents and viewed as a contrast to salvation in Christ. Galen, the famous physician, had perfected his medicine expertise in the care of wounded and dying gladiators and had them expanded that medical practice through the hospital in the temple of Asclepius. The temple of Asclepius itself has been extensively preserved and offers insight into the combination of the practice of medicine and psychology in the first century. Present in the temple complex is a theater and various baths, some of which were rather uniquely engineered achievements, uh, enabling the raising or lowering of the water so that those immersed in the bath were unable to account for the phenomenon. Some suggest this entered into the healing process so that the rising of the waters would be an indication that Asclepius had honored the request for healing. A long tunnel connected the bathhouse area with the solarium, which was a large round building boasting what amounted to a track. Small apertures in the top of the tunnel enabled priests of Asclepius to speak promising words to devotees walking through the tunnel in search of healing. In the solarium, some sources indicate the presence of hundreds of non-poisonous snakes whose permanent residence was the solarium. With the assistance of certain drugs, a participant in the activities of the solarium might sleep for a period of time or even a night in the dormitories of Asclepion, while non-poisonous snakes crawled around them during their sleep. They were told that the serpent god Asclepius would speak to them in dreams and give them a diagnosis. It was believed that the snakes carried the healing power of Asclepius, and if the snake slithered across you while you were sleeping at night, that was a divine sign that healing power was coming to you. The next morning, the patients told their dreams to the priests who prescribed their treatments. Finally, the patients made clay sculptures of the body parts that needed healing and offered them to Asclepius. And to the angel of the church in Pergamus write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. 
Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. By John's time, Pergamon had been a city of considerable importance for at least four preceding centuries and had an estimated population of 120,000. If Ephesus was the New York of Asia, Pergamon was its Washington, for there the Roman imperial power had a seat of government. In addition to its political importance, Pergamon was celebrated as the center of intellectual life in the whole Hellenistic world. Pergamon was also a great and important religious center. It had become, by the time of the first century, the center of emperor worship in the Roman world. Pergamon is a precarious place to live, having Satan's throne in your neighborhood. There are so many opportunities to compromise. Satan is working here through the pressures of non-Christian society. They have not yet renounced their allegiance to Christ, but they are already dancing around the edges of apostasy. Again, Christ introduced himself with one of his descriptions from Revelation 1 vision, which is uniquely appropriate for the situation of this church. To the church at Pergamon, Christ writes as the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. What significance is there in Christ's reminder of this having a sword? Roman governors were divided into two classes, those who had the Ius Gladii, the right of the sword, and those who did not. Those who had the right of the sword had the power of life and death. On their word, a person could be executed on the spot. In terms of worldly power, the proconsul who had his headquarters at Pergamum had the Ius Gladii, the right of the sword, and at any moment he might use it against any Christian. But the letter tells the Christians not to forget that the last word is still with the risen Christ who has the sharp two-edged sword. According to the epistle to the Hebrews, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The persecutors of God's people might be satanically powerful, yet the power of the resurrected Christ is greater. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. He is indeed in control, in control of human history and in control of your life. Jesus has full knowledge of this church's situation. I know where you dwell, where the throne of Satan is. Christ has in mind not only the city of Pergamum as such, but the conditions, religious, social, and moral, in which the Christians in Pergamum live, especially the emperor worship practiced there. To be a Christian in Pergamum was to face what Oliver Cromwell, the protector of England, would have called an engagement very difficult. The Christians in Pergamum lived in a religious and moral climate which was hostile to their faith. The Greek text indicates that they reside there permanently. On one hand, they were surrounded by paganism and its magnificent and temples. On the other, they were exposed to a pagan religious lifestyle and immoral practices. No wonder the lifestyle of the pagan religion was in its own way very appealing to some Christians in Pergamum. Above all, emperor worship created a difficult environment for this church. At any time, the authorities would summon the Christians and order them to worship the emperor and denounce Christ on threat of persecution and death. Those who complied were issued a certificate. This made the city a place where Satan dwells and where his rule was the strongest. Today, in the same way, the devil is looking to destroy God's children, you and I, through seduction or persecution. For this reason, we must be alert. The Apostle Peter wrote, Be alert, be on watch. Your enemy the devil roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour.
We cannot allow God's enemy to have free access in our lives as he had in Pergamum. Only through Jesus can we overcome the enemy. In these adverse conditions, the church at Pergamum had remained true to the name of Christ. They had not denied their faith by yielding to the pressure of burning incense to the emperor and declaring, Caesar is Lord. Even in the days of Antipas, who was put to death in their city, they did not renounce their faith. Little is known about this early martyr apart from this reference in Revelation. The name is found in a third century inscription of Pergamum, and he is mentioned by Tertullian. The legend appears in later hagiographies, and it is said that he was slowly roasted to death in a brazen bull during the reign of Domitian. What is noteworthy is that he is given the Lord's own title from Revelation 1 verse 5, Faithful Witness. Later martyrs in Pergamum are identified as Carpus, Papillus, and Agathemike. The Pergamins are evidently a divided church. Some of them, like Antipas, held fast Christ's names and did not deny their faith. Namely, they were opposed to any compromise with the word's conduct and lifestyle. Others in Pergamon held to the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, while the Ephesians perceived the destructive effects of the deceptive teachings of the Nicolaitans. The churches in Pergamon and Thyatira tolerated these false teachers and the compromise made to their religion. The fact that the Balaamites and Nicolaitans are mentioned together suggests they were somehow related. We met them earlier in Ephesus, and we'll meet them again in the message to the church in Thyatira. These false teachers advocated compromise and sought to persuade their fellow Christians there was nothing wrong with a prudent conformity with the world's standards in order to escape persecution. As a part of the civic obligations of the society in which they lived, the Christians in Asia were expected to participate in religious festivals in the pagan temples. A refusal to participate brought ridicule and the hardships of social isolation and economic sanctions. The Christians in Asia faced at least two problems with regard to their involvement in the pagan religious festivals. The first problem was related to the eating of food offered to idols. The participants at the pagan festivals would usually feast on food that consisted primarily of meat that was offered to the local patron god. The festivals often ended with drunkenness and immoral activities. The second problem with regard to the pagan religious festivals was the cult prostitution, the, the practice that was a part of many ancient pagan religions. Anyone who wanted economic or political or social status in society had to participate in these religious demands. For some, the easy way is always the best option. They compromise principles for an easygoing path. What is wrong or not appropriate, according to the Bible, somehow becomes right in order to please someone or, or for a comfortable journey. But Jesus is clear. Go in through the narrow gate, because the gate to hell is wide, and the road that leads to it is easy, and there are many who travel it. But the gate to life is narrow, and the way that leads to it is hard, and there are few people who find it. On behalf of those who have sinned, the Christians of Pergamum are told by the risen Christ, repent, a decisive action of turning around. Evil must not be countenanced. Repentance is the only hope for survival that the church would have had. Failure to repent means that the risen Christ will do battle against them with the sword of his mouth. All of this is imagery, of course, but it is difficult to escape its very strong implications that Christ intends to purify his church and will personally do battle against those who pervert his pure gospel into something else. For this reason, an appeal resounds through the ages. Repent, then, and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins.
those who repent are given a threefold promise. They will be given the hidden manna, a white stone, and a new name written on the stone. The false teachers in Pergamum advocated compromise in eating the pagan food sacrificed to idols in order to get a certificate and avoid discomfort. The day is coming when those who remain faithful and refuse to participate in pagan feasts will participate in a feast of heavenly food, the hidden manna, bread of angels, reserved only for the overcomers who reject compromise and hold fast to Christ's name. Instead of the Roman certificate, they will receive a white stone with a new name inscribed on it as a reward for remaining faithful and loyal to Christ. In ancient times, a judge gave a white stone to indicate his decision of legal acquittal or pardon. He presented a black stone if the defendant was guilty. In the context of persecution and false accusations of the church in Pergamum, the new name signifies a restoration of dignity of a good name. A white stone with a new name inscribed on it entitles the overcomer to special privileges that surpass any pleasure of this life, an eternal life. Dear friend, maybe you right now are suffering because of your love for Christ. Please, don't give up. Jesus is with you. But perhaps this is not your case. Maybe you have chosen the easy way. Compromise has crept in. The distinction between right and wrong has become blurred. There's too much tolerance, too little discipline. It's time to embrace Christ's call to repentance. My friend, in the word of Christ, there is conviction of sin. In it, we are confronted with the truth and thereby with our own failure to obey it. In the word of Christ, there is an invitation to God. It convicts people of sin and invites them back into the love of God. In the word of Christ, there is assurance of salvation. It convicts people of sin. It leads them to the cross and assures them that there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Listen to Jesus' gentle invitation right now. Turn to him. Leave the world behind. Accept his love, his forgiveness, and his peace. Accept his salvation. yourself and for once be honest and true take a deep look inside at all the feelings there something's not right you cannot explain so ask your heart where happiness true for that will indeed expose the truth you're pretending to be okay trying to hide the pain living a loveless life so hard to be daily life 
still to hear his voice now is the moment and find him in your life let god's peace be part of who you are trust and believe in him your life will be Our Father and our God, we come to you just now in the name of Jesus. So thankful for your grace, for your forgiveness when we turn to you with all our hearts. I pray, Father, that you would help us today. Bless uh, us with the willingness to heed your call to repentance, to plunge deep into a relationship with you that is, that is rewarding and saving. I pray, God, that you would bless each one listening to this prayer. Give them the assurance of salvation that their sins are forgiven, cleansed in the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would lead us on. Help us to leave the world behind and to press on in your ways. In that narrow road, may our lives bring honor and glory to you. It is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Dear friend, thank you so much for watching us today. Don't forget to share the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ and Turkey with your friends and relatives. Please visit our website. On our website, you can leave us a message, your prayer request, and order a copy of today's show or the completed series. If you feel moved to support our ministry, you can make your donation on our website as well. I hope to see you again soon.